Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for Yet one for all the earth, her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food, then to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Mid toil and tribulation and a tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading. The Old Testament reading today is from the book of Samuel. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. 
The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read the response from Psalms in unison. Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured, how he swore an oath to the Lord and vowed a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not come under the roof of my house nor climb up into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep nor let my eyelids slumber until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. The ark, we heard it was in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of Jerem. Let us go to God's dwelling place. Let us fall upon our knees before his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your saint place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, let your faithful people sing with joy. For your servant David's sake, do not, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn an oath to David. In truth, we will not break it. A son, the fruit of your body, will I set upon your throne. If your children keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their children will sit upon your throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired her for his habitation. This shall be my resting place forever. Here will I dwell, for I delight in her. I will surely bless her provisions and satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful people will rejoice and sing. There will I make the horn of David flourish. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed, and for his enemies I will clothe them with shame. But as for him, his crown will shine. The epistle today is from Revelations. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The Gospel of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. My kingdom is not from this world. Today, the final Sunday of our church calendar year is the feast of Christ the King. Now, this is one of the church's newest formal celebrations, which Pope Pius XI instituted only 99 years ago as his response to increasing secularization and growing nationalism throughout Europe between the world wars. As more and more countries followed the United States and divested themselves, not only of government-sponsored churches, but of monarchies themselves, Many religious leaders feared that faith traditions, or at least Christianity, would become a thing of the past. And it was a reasonable fear, once people stopped being forced to pay taxes for the clergy to live large, or were no longer required to attend services, they fled church buildings in droves, much like the stereotype of a modern teenager. The sun was setting on the only world anyone had known for generation upon generation. And now, with nearly a century of insight between us and them, it's easy to recognize the Pope's action as one of Christendom's last gasps. You don't hear much about Christendom today. It isn't something that we reference in conversation or hear about on the news. 
So most of us don't even necessarily understand what the term means. Those familiar with it likely think of Christendom as the 1600 or so years when Christianity flourished in the West. Vast swaths of the population were presumably devoted to Christ. And Western culture itself was thoroughly infused with supposed biblical concepts and mores. Although highly romanticized, aspects of that were true. Christendom did often appear in that guise. But that isn't technically what the word refers to. Christendom wasn't simply a historical era, but the broad adoption of Christianity as the state-sanctioned religion, the union of church and state, or as I would term it, church as empire. Empire being the formally legislated or culturally demanded authorization of oppression, sometimes even overt violence, which attempts to ensure both physical and mental conformity throughout a populace. Empire is what gives the powerful power and maintains them in that power. When New Testament authors use terminology regarding the world, they're referring to what I'm calling empire. Now the seeds for this were sown all the way back in 313 CE, when Constantine's Edict of Milan legalized Christianity throughout the Roman Empire, ending centuries of sporadic and generally localized persecution of the early church. Although one of several recognized religious systems of the time, Christianity soon became not simply an acceptable form of religion, but the official form of religion, forcing people to abandon their worship of traditional Greek or Roman or tribal European gods. In the process, Christianity became fused with formal Roman culture. We in liturgical churches still see evidence of that hybridization today, most easily in our expectations around vestments. As clergy became more powerful politically and stepped into high governmental positions, the clothing associated with those ranks eventually became the expected dress for various positions within the church hierarchy. So think of stoles or chasubles or particularly those hats that bishops wear. Now, apart from England's eventual tolerance of various Christian movements in the centuries following the Reformation, this conflation of church and state was the Western norm until the signing of the U.S. Bill of Rights. Before that time, the people of a particular country or government were expected to follow the religion of their ruler. Much like the reports of household conversion in the book of Acts, once the king chose to convert to Christianity, the entire populace became Christian. You might have been worshiping Pan or Bridget or Odin the day before, but once word came, those gods went out the window, suddenly replaced by the monotheistic trinity. But the success of our country, which at its founding became the first Western nation officially outside the formal sway of Christendom, paved the way for the end of a European way of life that had endured for thousands of years. That's a lot of history and might sound more like a lecture than a sermon. But it's important for us to pay attention to and to remember these things. If we ignore or forget them, we miss enduring patterns in our lives and culture, such as the fact that many of us still worship Christ as king under the illusions of Christendom. When the church speaks, and we presume society ought to listen, that is a remnant of Christendom. Church as the mouthpiece for state, or church as the voice of empire. When the state offloads its historic responsibility to provide for its most vulnerable people to so-called faith-based organizations, 
that is actually a remnant of Christendom. Church expected to be the charitable arm of state or church as branch of empire. When we try to impose laws demanding so-called biblical standards on other portions of society, that is also a remnant of Christendom. Church legislating through the state or the church as empire. The truth is, whenever we see or participate in using Christianity or portions of the Bible as a means of domination or a benchmark of superiority or as a measurement of patriotism, we reveal within ourselves not devotion to God, but the manipulations of empire embedded even within how we've been taught to think. So what do we do with that? How can we overcome this impulse of empire hidden within each of our souls? We look with new awareness to Jesus Christ, our Savior and the Prince of Peace, the one who is our true King. We look beyond all our expectations of glory and wisdom and influence and strength. We pass by our many implements of dominance and manipulation and coercion. All of the imperial expectations that we have for a king. And we adopt, with Christ and as his body, the most gentle yet thoroughly life-changing powers that kingship can offer. Compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. We remain faithful to Christ, who rules over people justly, ruling, that is, examining his own actions in the fear of God. We rely on Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a new kind of kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. We worship Christ, whose kingdom is not from this world, whose reign is decidedly and objectively unlike the empire within which we've all been formed. We subdue our own pride and redirect our power, that which we do possess, looking not to our personal interests, but to the needs and concerns of others. We step away from our craving for authority and Instead, walk in love and humility. We look beyond our individual ambitions or desires and envision the betterment and flourishing of all. We avoid paths of exclusionary thoughts and practices, choosing instead to embrace and truly welcome all God's children, those we already know and those we've never yet envisioned. We reject the lures and deceits of empire and instead turn our hearts and hands to realize the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. We gather and set our eyes on the image of Christ. We come together at the table to bond as Christ. And we go forth to live not as people shaped and held by our present empire, but as genuine citizens enculturated in the kingdom that is love and mercy and peace. My kingdom, Christ's present actual reign, is not from or like this world. Amen. Having heard the word of the Lord, let's stand and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers to the people are on form two, found on page 385 in the Book of Common Prayer, or on page nine in your booklet. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Sean Rowe, our presiding bishop, for Michael Hunt, our bishop, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison, remembering especially Al, Phyllis, Kirk, Jameson, Cynthia, Richard, Abraham, Lindsay, Ali, Chrissy, Whit, Jessica, Bryce, Aiden, Daniel, Will, Emily, Landon, Gabriel, Arlene, Carissa, DJ, Diana, Jace, Jamie, Levi, Helaman, Tina. Are there others? Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may be found and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed, remembering especially Ed Brittle, Hillis and Mary Sanford, Frank Lale, Tom England, Ed Mount, Linda Chavez, Carol Taylor, Chalmer Bowlby, Marjorie Brown, R.A. Miller, Francis Hamill, Deborah McKenzie, Joan Witherholt, Trish Fisher. Are there others? Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for the Anglican Communion, especially the Anglican Church of South America. Pray for the Anglican Communion. I ask your prayers for the Diocese of the Rio Grande, especially for all retired and non-parochial clergy, spouses, and surviving spouses. Ministry of the Chaplain for Retired Clergy and Surviving Spouses. The health and well-being of elders. I ask your prayers for our parish, especially for our ministries to mid-high and senior high youth, and for all who assist in these ministries. 
pray for St. Andrew's Las Cruces. I ask your prayers for those serving in our armed forces, especially Rufus Allen, Will Bentain, Kurt Campos, Jonathan Courtney, Daniel Fuller, Mary Samantha Katzenberger, Trevor Rankin, Zachary Tierney, Michael Claxton, and Paul Amons. Pray for those serving and all who are in harm's way. I ask your prayers for our missionaries, especially Anna Reza and Mike Wallens, Perry and Samra Mansfield, Sean Martin, the Mustard Seed Babies Home, and Bruce Reed. Pray for our missionaries. I invite your thanksgivings. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, remembering especially the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Andrew, and all the saints. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Taking a moment for reflection, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. Once again, good morning, and thank you for joining us this final Sunday of the church calendar year. So that does mean Advent begins next Sunday. So get ready for judgment, terror, destruction, and the end of the world, as Advent is meant to do. <laughs> um, if you have not yet picked one up, um, the ushers do have one of these light yellow sort of tan colored sheets at the back. It has upcoming events on it, along with things happening this week at the church. Uh, let's see, Lynn, let's start with you.
that many churchgoers, it's that time of year that many churchgoers dread. It's time to talk about stewardship. This year's theme is walking in love. And whenever I discuss one of those topics that's maybe not so fun, I like to invoke the words and wisdom of some notable person, hopefully someone with some levity. Today that person is Jeff Foxworthy. You may know him of his famous, you might be a redneck jokes. For example, if your home is on wheels and none of your cars is, you might be a redneck. <laughs> if someone shows up at your door every day, mistakenly thinking that you're having a yard sale, you might be a redneck. Let's put a St. Andrew's spin to this. If you hear Jesus calling us to heal, to visit, to feed, to accompany, to protect, to advocate, to love our neighbor, and to share our time, our talent, and our treasure, you might be walking in love. If you feel that our talents and training are gifts freely given to us by God, so we may share them with the world in need, you might be walking in love. If you're concerned about what our financial gifts can do for the world, you might be walking in love. You know, we only have two more weeks in our campaign. It ends on Sunday, December the 8th. Please, if you can, return to us by that date your pledge so that we may count it and add it to the many others to be blessed and broken and shared with the world. And finally, if you've ever made change from the offering plate, you might be a redneck. <laughs> hey, thank you, Lynn. We heard from a few people that they didn't uh, necessarily receive or find their pledge cards in the letter that went out. So please note that the ushers do have extra pledge cards at the back. You can pick one of those up uh, and fill that out for us. We'd appreciate it. All right, other reminders, the shoebox ministry is in full swing. They'll be having their stuffing party on December 8th over in the parish hall. Um, right around that same time, we'll also be putting up the greenery in the church. So those of you who like to stuff things, please join there. Those of you who like to stand on ladders, uh, please join us in here. <laughs> All right, the, uh, I wanted to point out that the Hospitality House is hiring right now a outreach coordinator. Um, it's not a super high, uh, super high time consuming mission. Uh, I believe it's about 10 hours a month is what's expected, but they are looking to find someone for that position. Uh, also note on the back of the form that the Daughters of the King are having a quiet day on December 14th. They have a sheet out in the uh, gathering space for people to sign up for that. Also, vestry elections will be coming up in a few weeks. Um, the vestry is the basically the board of the church, for those of you who might not be familiar with all of the Episcopal terminology. So they are the body that makes decisions regarding uh, future directions for the church, financial things with the church, that kind of stuff. Um, if any of you are interested in being on the vestry, you can please contact either me or the office and we can get you more information um, or get you on the ballot if you decide that that is what you would like to do. Our weekly activities are definitely truncated this week. So on Tuesday, we have our morning prayer service over in the Kendrick Chapel at 9.30. Then uh, Thursday, to my knowledge, all the breakfasts are canceled. Uh, the noon service is definitely canceled, and that is being replaced by a service at 10.30 in the morning down at St. James, so uh, more South Main area. So 10.30 in the morning on Thursday, a Thanksgiving service at St. James, followed by a potluck for those who wish to join that as well. Uh, I don't know of any active issues with this, but it's always a good time of year to remind people about text and email scams. Now, we are in the midst of stewardship season, so you will receive letters and possibly official church emails that talk about money. But outside of that, 
we will never be asking you for money for gift cards. We will never be asking you for, you know, some sort of secret little thing over here that, oh, I want to do something for the staff, but I can't let anybody know, so I have to text you directly. Um, those are always fake, always, always fake. So please do not fall for them. If you receive things like that, claiming to be from the church, uh, please do either report them to your service provider or just delete them. Um, but do not respond to them. Do not give them cause to continue. All right, do we have anyone who would like to come forward for a birthday or anniversary blessing? Then we'll continue with our offertory sentence. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power, is 
We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be made acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary and Andrew and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Be known to us, Lord Jesus, in the breaking of the bread.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make their face to shine upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen. into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I made it to the wine. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs>